I am Dr. George Zeller. I am the head doctor and facilitator for the Illinois Asylum for the Incurable Insane. Some would say that I am the very definition of sanity, yet I still find myself questioning what I witnessed six months ago. It was awful, but it was real. I saw it, my staff saw it, and countless spectators witnessed it. Since the ghostly tree finally fell today of its own will, I have decided to document this story. I wish to cleanse my mind of this, to wipe my memory of what I saw would be a blessing. On this second day of February, 1911, this is my account of a man we came to call a manual bookbinder. came to us from Chicago, very fit, but sadly he looked much older than he was. Name please, sir. They he was mute and illiterate, possible side effects from a severe nervous breakdown. All we knew at the time was that he was demented and that he was a bookbinder before he came to us. Welcome to your new home, Mr. Bookbinder. A period manual bookbinder became his name, although he quickly became known as Old Book for short. He came with nothing but the clothes on his back and an old black hat. No past to speak of, no stories to share, just a manual bookbinder. When I first encountered him, he had so much nervous energy. I felt that physical labor was the best treatment. Manual labor helped patients like him keep their minds lucid and comfortable. I needed men for burial duty, so book was a perfect fit. The moment I handed him the shovel, I saw something, a foreshadowing, but I refused to acknowledge it at the time. Let it be known that old book became the best on the crew. He seemed delighted to do the work. His stamina was legendary throughout the entire facility. With the attention and admiration came curiosity amongst the admitted. He became by far the most admired, most trusted, and most respected patient. The more manual labor he did, the more stable he became. Everyone wanted to be associated with him, or at least know him. Slowly but surely, as with all good therapy, he began to come out of his shell. It was because of old book that my methods began to be recognized by the state. He was living proof that my treatment was working. Let's never forget what she endured. Let's never forget how special she was. Sleep well, Rhoda Deary. My wife Sophie and I attended the funeral of a patient I equally admired to old book. Many of my staff attended, 
but sadly, only one family member was at the procession. I pity the poor girl mourning a loss of a relative that most had forgotten about or were unwilling to acknowledge she existed. Thank you. It shows how much he cares when he cries. And I pity the mad soul who finally found peace in her grave. She was someone truly special. A family member approached me and thanked me for the wonderful service. She told me that she was comforted by the fact that the patients cared for each other. It was at that moment that I realized that bookbinders should bear witness to every funeral. Did he know her? No. Not like we did. It may have seemed callous. Bookbinder was a boom for our public relations problem. Though we made the facility look better, I was concerned with how the funerals may affect his rehabilitation. But on the other hand, it was a way to vent his emotions. So Bookbinder attended every funeral. And at every funeral, he wept against the same tree. It did not matter if he knew the departed or not. He wept for them all the same. His displays of emotion became such an integral part of the institution that many patients felt that Bookbinder needed to be at every funeral to ward off bad omens. Unfortunately, after almost five years of loyal service, old Book began to fall ill. tried to stop him from doing his job. But it seemed the more sick Book became, the more determined he was to finish his work. Unfortunately, one day the sickness took too much out of him, and he collapsed. He was no longer able to do his work or to be in public. Word of Book's illness spread through the facility and created quite a stir among the sick and dying. Dr. Zeller, it's Barton, sir. He... Barton cannot see Book. But he just wants Bookbinder to cry for him, sir. He's afraid he'll die before... Yes, Barton is very ill and still very dangerous. He will try to make Bookbinder cry for him and might accidentally kill him. Yes, sir. Send two orderlies to Barton's bed. Have them keep him there. Yes, sir. You know what must be done. I can't risk another patient's life to satisfy another. Barton's Pellegria has sealed his fate. Tell them to do whatever it takes, but keep him in bed. Yes, doctor. Now restraining a patient is not part of my practice. But in this unfortunate case, I thought it was necessary. A decision that still haunts me to this day. significance to death's passage. The patients believe that if Bookbinder did not attend their funerals, their passage into heaven would be compromised. In Book's final hours, I do believe a divine hand was leading Book to his final fate. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, 
Book's gone. We searched the Pollock and he's nowhere to be found. What do you mean gone? Book could barely stand, let alone leave. All right. Gather up the patients and send them back to their quarters. Yes, Doctor. Hey, I don't want the patients to know about this. We don't want to cause a stir, understand? Yes, Doctor. William? William, you know where, don't you? All right, go. Go find him. Bookbinder's life began to slip away. His tree began to as well. Within minutes of Book's passing, all the tree's leaves had fallen like tears. It was as if the tree was weeping the loss of a loved one. Our facility suffered several outbreaks and flu epidemics that claimed several lives, including our beloved old book. Most of the staff and patients attended his funeral. My wife and I, being so fond of him, also attended. At each death, he found great sorrow. At each passing, he wept tears for the unloved and forgotten. Now, old book, we weep for you. It is book. book. Bury him. George, have we been bewitched? George! There in his coffin, as if he had always been there, lay the body of old book. I sent an orderly over to the tree to see if anybody else was there. There was nothing but a single red handkerchief. I would like to say the story ended with that unsightly ordeal, but it did not. With the falling of the leaves, the tree began to rot. I sent my best ax man to cut the tree down. Every time he took a swing at the tree, he could hear somebody crying and refused to cut it down. So I decided to have the tree burned. The tree could not be burned because the men swore to me that they could hear somebody crying and saw a figure fitting Book's description in the base. decided to leave the tree alone and to not speak of it again. Eventually, the tree fell on its own. Like its beloved book, it's in God's hands now. fallen? Will the memories that haunt me in my most private moments leave me as well? 
or will he continue to haunt these grounds a hundred years from now, long after I'm gone and forgotten?